Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second Senate Occasional Lecture for 2012. My name is Bronwyn Knotson and I'm the Clerk Assistant Procedure here in the Department of the Senate. I'm standing in for Dr Rosemary Lang, the Clerk of the Senate, who sends her apologies today, but as avid parliamentary followers, you will know that the Senate is sitting today to consider the mining tax package. And so next week, of course, promises to be a very interesting and exciting week. We're very pleased to introduce our distinguished speaker today, Dr Andrew C. Banfield, lecturer in the School of Politics in International Relations at the Australian National University here in Canberra, and the inaugural director at the Australian Federalism Centre. Dr Banfield has a bachelor's and master's, degree, master's of arts from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and a PhD in, from the University of Calgary, in which his thesis title was Legislative and the Judiciary Checks and Balances, Rights and Policy in Canada and Australia. And as a lawyer, I must say that PhD title makes me go, ooh, how exciting. <laughs> Doctor, as you, many of you would know, Dr. Fanfield has written a number of articles and conference papers, including my personal favourite, which is entitled, It's the Charter, Stupid, The Charter and Courts in Federal Partisan Politics. Dr. Banfield's expertise in minority governments is particularly relevant to Australia today, and his insights on the comparisons and similarities between Canada and Australia will be particularly valuable. So please do well, join me in welcoming Dr. Banfield. Uh, well, thank you for coming today, and thank you to Brian for chairing the session and the Department of the Senate for having me. It is my distinct pleasure to be here. Um, minority parliaments are, are interesting, and when I get the chance to talk uh, not only about Parliament but also about Canada, I never turn that opportunity down. Uh, so I, I do hope that you enjoy today. It struck me when I was preparing this lecture uh, about a couple of things. Uh, I, I was drafting a, a series of slides and uh, I was struck by a, a Dickens passage. He begins A Tale of Two Cities as, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. And it occurs to me that he could have been talking about minority parliaments. Uh, Canadian minority parliament particularly is, is illustrative of this. Uh, we've had some of our best public policy, universal health care comes out of a minority parliament, and we've had some of our most divisive debates uh, in Canada as well. Uh, the flag debate comes to mind. And uh, most recently, the, uh, the three minority parliaments that we'll talk about today have been particularly uh, contentious and difficult uh, to manage. I'm going to try to answer three questions today. Uh, one, what are some of the major themes that emerged from Canada's most recent period of minority parliaments? Two, what lessons can Australia learn from our foibles and indeed experiences? And three, the sort of the, the punchy bit of the, of the lecture, I hope, is what's so bad about minority parliament? Uh, in uh, the effort to give away the store early on, the short answer is nothing. Uh, a bit of context I always find is helpful, particularly when we uh, talk about Canada. The Liberal Party of Canada is in the middle. The Conservative Party of Canada is on the right. Uh, and the New Democratic Party of Canada is on the left. There's a, uh, a fourth uh, major party known as the Bloc, and they want to break the country apart. Uh, Canada's electoral system is, is a plurality system, uh, uh, which means you have to basically get more votes than the other guy, uh, but not necessarily a majority to win your seat. And unlike Australia, there is no compulsory voting. Voter turnout in the last federal election is somewhere between 60 and 65 percent, and that is a constant source of angst for uh, Canadian political scientists. A bit more context. We've had minority parliaments by what I've called the Baker's Dozen, 13 uh, up to and including the 2008 election. And you can sort of divide them into three distinct time periods, which uh, I find particularly helpful sort of the 1921 to 1930 period, the 1957 to 1979 period, and of course 2004 to 2011. The average length of a Canadian minority parliament is 18 months. Some go a little longer, some go substantially shorter. Uh, Joe Clark, uh, former prime minister, can tell you how much shorter. There they are. Um, 
sort of a period of bouncing back and forth between liberals and conservatives, the two uh, governing parties as we understand them. Uh, liberals are far, by far more successful in the Canadian context than our conservatives. For the purposes of today, we are interested in the Martin Liberal Minority Parliament and the back-to-back -back Harper Conservative Minority Parliaments. The 2004 election, this is the electoral map, was a moment of remarkable change in Canadian uh, electoral history. Uh, I've entitled this, The Beginning of the Liberal Decline, which is probably more overwrought than it needs to be, but it is also uh, useful in all sorts of ways. Uh, after a period of uh, almost 16 years in uh, majority government territory, basically since, uh, uninterrupted since 1988, the Liberals were reduced to minority parliament status. Um, the real story, however, and we'll come back to this as an emerging theme, is the declining dominance of the Liberal Party in cities, uh, particularly eastern cities east of uh, Western Canada, which is the remarkably blue bit. It's also uh, an electoral landscape change. It's the first election with the newly formed and unified Conservative Party of Canada. For the period of 1993 until 2004, we had two right-of-center parties who split the vote in all kinds of ways and allowed the Liberal Party dominance simply to come up the middle. Uh, Stephen Harper, uh, the current Prime Minister, rejoins the parties together and he uh, successfully fights his first election and does uh, remarkably well. Some highlights of the 38th Parliament. The first time in a long time, as I said, we had returned back to minority parliament status. In part, and this is a, certainly a theme that you find going back through history, minority parliaments chase scandal. And most recently, the biggest scandal was the sponsorship scandal in Canada. The sponsorship scandal stems out of a, a policy to celebrate Canadianness, uh, particularly in the province of Quebec, in the aftermath of the 1995 referendum. Uh, as some of you, I'm sure, know, the 1995 referendum on the independence of Quebec, uh, Canadians came dangerously close to breaking apart their country, somewhere in the neighborhood of 55,000 votes short, which is remarkable. So uh, Prime Minister Chrétien at the time passes a law which funnels money into a system that says we should celebrate Canadian. So you could dial a 1-800 number or a toll-free number, for example, and they would send you a Canadian flag free of charge. Uh, this was particularly uh, useful and targeted at the province of Quebec to show that you know, Canada, we, we, we love you, we want you, please stay. Uh, it is the, the quintessential Canadian group hug, as a good colleague of mine calls it. Interestingly, when you funnel large sums of money into a particular uh, program with very little oversight, as it turns out, money happens to funnel in interesting ways, not least of which was brown paper envelopes back to uh, the Liberal Party of Canada. Indeed, most of the sponsorship money, or, or certainly some of the sponsorship money, went to Liberal Party friendly advertisers who, again, back with the brown paper envelope, under the table, it was the closest to mafia politics that we will ever get in Canada. So the sponsorship scandal hangs over the Martin government like a pall, as uh, Peter Russell called it. And indeed, even before the 38th Parliament sits, uh, the opposition leaders, including Stephen Harper, Gilles Duceppe, Jack Layton, call on the Governor General to consider all of her options before handing the keys of power to uh, Paul Martin. And indeed, a mere six months into the 38th Parliament, we have the motion of confidence that I've called that really wasn't. Uh, it was a procedural, pass, a procedural point that defeated the government, 153 to 150 on the floor of the House, and generally when the government is defeated on what was deemed early on to be a confidence measure, uh, the government is supposed to resign. At least that's how I teach responsible government. Turns out that is not how Prime Minister Martin was taught responsible government, and he appealed to uh, the Speaker, uh, Peter Milliken, who went, oh well, it really wasn't a real confidence measure, it was merely on a, a vote of procedure, so we can ignore it. Fine. Uh, six months after that, during their first budget, their first budget comes down to a 152 to 152 tie uh, with independence holding the balance of power. Again, we call on 
the Speaker, Mr. Milliken, to break a tie. And as uh, precedent dictates, the Speaker votes with uh, the way in which to keep debate open and on the floor so the budget passes second reading. Interestingly, and this is for the historians in the room, this is the first time in Canadian history that the Speaker has ever cast a vote on a deciding vote on a confidence measure. We go merrily along, sponsorship scandal, the Garmer Commission reports, eventually they go to the point where the, the Martin government can no longer carry on. The, the, the findings of the Gomery report, the follow-up from the sponsorship scandal, are scathing, and, and we go to an election. The 2006 election, something new happens. For the first time in 18 years, we get a conservative minority. And if you recall back to the 2004 map that looks remarkably similar to this one, you'll notice that we've gone from very dark red in Ontario in the east to a light pink color which is indicative of the declining support of the Liberal Party. Uh, I've entitled this the, the Rise of the Conservative Party, which is probably, again, more overdramatic than it needs to be, but it's, it's, a, it's a pithy title. Prime Minister Paul Martin resigns from the Liberal leadership the night of the election, when he's not soundly defeated, but certainly defeated, and decides to go and sit on the back bench, which is, again, unusual. Most Prime Ministers or, or most leaders, once they resign, they don't resign the backbench, they just leave Parliament altogether. This leaves the opposition parties, uh, particularly the Liberal Party, in remarkable disarray. Paul Martin had spent the better part of 18 years trying to become Liberal leader, and he gets his shot at the reins of power, and in fact, it goes terribly amiss. He lost the 2006 election. Some 39th Parliament highlights. The Conservatives come to power for the first time in 18 years and in the resulting election uh, of Liberal leader through um, the semi-presidential style that Canadians have, Stéphane Dion becomes Liberal leader. Now, Stéphane Dion is a known quantity. He's a formal, former minister of the Federation. He's also a former environment minister. But Canadians, I think, and I speak for Canadians as a whole as of right now, Canadians, I think, went, Stéphane who? in part because Stefan Dion was everybody's second choice. The battle between Bob Ray, a former NDP Premier, and Michael Ignatieff split the Liberal Party and allowed uh, Stefan Dion to come up the middle. Now Stefan Dion was not, as it turns out, a particularly effective leader. And part of this was framing done by the Conservative Party of Canada. Before, I think, the ink dried on the contract to take the leadership of the Liberal Party, a scathing series of attack ads were unleashed by the Conservative Party of Canada, and we'll come back to this notion of sort of the permanent campaign in a minute. The scathing attack ads basically said, you're not a leader, and they ran a, a sound bite, which was, if you're uh, trying to attack a party leader, absolutely priceless. The sound bite was during a liberal leadership debate, and Stefan Dion was standing like this, and he goes, do you think it's easy to make priorities? His chief rival, Michael Ignatius, said, you didn't get it done. And that became an emerging theme and a continuing theme through the 39th Parliament. Again, we have the Speaker comes into play. And I think one of the, the interesting things that emerges from the Canadian uh, experience is how important parliamentary officers and, and the Governor General actually can, how important of a role they actually can play in a minority parliament. This is back-to-back -back minority parliaments, and again, we'll see another one, where the Speaker plays a very important role in determining uh, the rules. A Liberal backbencher introduced a motion that required the new Conservative government not only to implement but recognize the Kyoto Accord and, by extension, implement the Kyoto Accord and spend money. Again, if I go back to my, the way I teach responsible government, when I checked, the only one that could spend your money was the executive, and a Liberal backbencher was certainly not in the executive. The government challenges the, 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 the motion or the, or the law requiring them to implement and respect the Kyoto Accord. And Prime Minister Stephen Harper stands up and goes, wait a minute, we're going to challenge this on a point of order. You can't compel us to spend money. Clearly, he read the same textbooks I did on responsible government. The Speaker, Peter Milliken, says, well, no, it's not really compelling you to spend money because it's just saying that you need to 
meet your obligations, but we don't compel you to spend money in any kind of meaningful way. So the, the conservatives lost the challenge. We go merrily along for a while. And just before Parliament is set to resume, the Prime Minister Stephen Harper calls all of his uh, opposition leader colleagues, and I use colleagues very loosely in this term, uh, to 24 Sussex, which is the official residence of the Prime Minister, and basically asks them directly, as opposed to on the floor of the House, do I have your confidence? Each of the leaders, Stefan Dion, uh, the NDP leader, uh, Jack Layton, and, and Gilles Duceppe. And remarkably, and as a, as a political scientist, I was very surprised by this, remarkably, they turned up and went, no, I don't think we do. So, this is remarkable again for me. The Prime Minister emerges from 24 Sussex with a very solemn face and says, I no longer have the confidence on the floor of the House. Really? We didn't actually have a vote. But he toddles off to the, the Governor General and the writs are dropped. In the process, interestingly, Stephen Harper violates his own fixed election law date. He came to power in 2000. And six saying, we need to clean up government. We're going to run an open and transparent and clean government. And part of this was fixed election dates. We should take the power to call elections out of the hands of the prime minister and put it in the hands of parliament only to go to a specific date, provided I have the confidence in the floor of the house, which is how he got around it. So interestingly, instead of, I promise to run an open and transparent and clean government, well, the, four, the three guys that I met with, they don't like me very much, so we're going to go have another election. Which brings me to the 2008 election. Again, from the 2004, 2006 to 2008, we see basically all of the red on the map disappear. There's a little bit of pink, and you can explain away the outlier uh, of Newfoundland, the premier of Newfoundland, Danny Williams and Stephen Harper, the Prime Minister, were feuding over offshore oil and gas red, um, royalties. And Newfoundland, who was of the same at least political stripe, both conservatives, ran an ABC campaign, anybody but conservative. I don't care who you vote for as long as it's not Stephen Harper, which may explain the six liberal uh, members from Newfoundland. I've entitled this Conservatives in Control, and we thought we were in a perpetual motion or perpetual period of minority parliament. It turns out that political scientists really are bad at prediction because three years later we were back in majority parliament territory. Stefan Dion resigns the night of the election and he toddles off to the back benches, so there seems to be a recurring pattern here. Uh, Michael Ignatieff becomes new liberal leader, interim liberal leader, who becomes permanent liberal leader later on. Again, like Stefan Dion, the Conservatives paint him as a remarkable uh, individual, but his tagline is, he's only just visiting. Michael Ignatieff was a former Harvard professor, we should all aspire so high, uh, who spent the world, spent his time globetrotting the world reporting on current events. He only comes back to Canada, according to the Conservative Party, to become leader because he thinks he has this given right to become Prime Minister. He didn't toil away like all of the good Liberals, he just turns up and becomes, uh, says he's uh, the Prime Minister. Again, the, the Conservative Party, or the, the party machine, is really good at setting the debate and choosing the agenda. Early in the 40th Parliament, what we have is known as a parliamentary crisis. Despite what some of my commentators would say, it was not a constitutional crisis. These things happen in parliamentary democracies all the time. In in late 2008, in a budget update, the finance minister stood up and said, we are going to end public subsidies to political parties. Now, that strikes me as an odd place to put such an update. It was just sort of an economic update. It wasn't a full budget. And as you can imagine, the opposition parties, who basically lived off the public subsidy, were particularly upset about this. So there was backroom meetings and power brokers from the big parties, Jean Chrétien, a stalwart in the Liberal Party and former Prime Minister, Ed Broadbent, a stalwart in the NDP party, and propped up by the separatists, uh, Gilles Duceppe and the, and the Bloc, which was an interesting dynamic to see on TV. 
basically said, at our next opportunity, we are going to introduce a motion of non-confidence during opposition days and defeat the government. Now, there's a lesson here, and the lesson is don't go on national television and announce your plans to the prime minister, particularly because the prime minister is ruthless, like I suspect most good prime ministers are, at least in terms of a party sense. The good prime minister says, okay, we're going to push back your opposition day by a week, and we're also going to delay, because they were going to probably lose the vote on uh, the economic update, and he wanders off to Rideau Hall, home of the Governor General. For two hours, Canadians were glued to the television watching the front door of Rideau Hall. <laughs> yes, I was glued to the front door of Rideau Hall. The door would open, people would be excited, and some embarrassed looking security guard would just go, sorry, and close the door. <laughs> Finally, after two hours, the Prime Minister emerged, and he said, time out. I've asked the Governor General to probe Parliament. The Governor General has agreed. And we're all going to go away, and we're going to reset and come back with a new throne speech, a mere sort of two months after the last throne speech, uh, and uh, just play along. Eventually, after sort of a remarkably rocky start to the, uh, to the 40th Parliament, things roll merrily along. In fact, it becomes the longest minority parliament in Canadian history. But the end of uh, the 40th Parliament is, is just as interesting as the beginning of the minority parliament. And again, we come back to the speaker. Same speaker, Peter Milliken, in his chair. Uh, it was requested that uh, the government was requested to produce full costing on F-35 fighter jets. Those F-35 fighter jets, the same ones that Australians are waiting for. The government goes, hmm, that's national security. We can't let that go. So they appeal to the speaker, and the speaker says, Parliament has a right to see this. You should probably let that go. But I'm going to delay for two weeks, and I'm going to allow the adults in the room, the House leaders, to come up with an agreement that makes everybody happy. Shockingly, the House leaders couldn't come to an agreement. Go back to the floor of the Parliament. A ruling is put forth to the Speaker. The Speaker says, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you and your entire government are in contempt of Parliament. Flick it off to the Procedures Committee. The Committee says, yes, indeed, you are in contempt of Parliament. They come back. Uh, we have a motion. It's a very simple motion due to the contempt of Parliament charge. The, the, the Parliament of Canada no longer has confidence in the Prime Minister, and he loses. Why is this interesting? It was the first time ever in Westminster parliamentary tradition that a government was defeated on a contempt of parliament charge. The Brits didn't do it. Australians haven't done it. Canadians haven't done it. In the entire Westminster tradition, ever. What do Canadians do as a result? Well, we go and elect in 2011 a uh, 166 seat majority for the Conservative Party of Canada, the same one that had sort of offended Parliament's deep sensibilities a mere 36 days earlier. So after four elections in seven years, majority Parliament had returned to Canada with a substantial majority, sort of 11 seats clear of what was needed for majority Parliament. So what can we learn as Australians or what can you know, Australia provide for Canada the next time around, because majority parliament in Canada will certainly be back. So what lessons can be learned uh, by Australians and Canadians in conjunction with minority parliaments? I think the first lesson, and the most important lesson perhaps, is a question of leadership. Minority parliaments work very, very well when you have clear, manageable targets. Now, it doesn't matter to me where you find clear, manageable targets. If they're in the election campaign, that would be good but if they make them up out of thin air, that's okay too. A great example is the Accountability Act in 2006 with Prime Minister Harper. He came to power saying he wanted clean, accountable, transparent democracy. And part of this was this big omnibus bill that did all of these things, better reporting, better management of data. And when they were on point, 
Tough on Crime and the Accountability Act, which was the other major plank, Tough on Crime, they did pretty well. When they run out of stuff to do, usually after 18 months in the Canadian case, is when minority parliaments tend to fall apart because we need to find something new to do. And we're not really good at that because we thought we'd been defeated already. The second question of leadership is learn how to manage the House. Make sure you get your ducks in a row, which is important in all parliaments, don't get me wrong, but it's particularly important if one of your coalition, informal coalition partners or someone that you're expecting to prop you up uh, breaks ranks and votes against you, right? So there's always the surprise factor, and it's really important to have a strong House leader. Finally, I think on the question of leadership, you need to set and control the agenda. By setting the agenda, you frame the debate on terms that you can win with. So, faced with a new opposition leader, you frame that opposition leader in the public's eye. Stefan Dion never recovered from, it's not easy to make priorities. Michael Ignatieff never recovered from the question of, well, he's just visiting. And you also need to find your advantage. The Liberal parties are very good, or, or the Conservative Party, rather, is very good at fundraising and election campaigns. That's become the big blue machine, which has replaced the old Liberal big red machine. The most successful political party in the world was the Liberal Party of Canada. And it's fallen in disarray and been replaced with the Conservative Party of Canada. You target your opponent, you raise money better than anybody else, and you run election campaigns that are tight as anything. No one speaks off message without uh, the permission of the Prime Minister, and no one gets permission to speak off message. I think another lesson that's more transferable, uh, and certainly we're seeing it here, is this notion of the permanent campaign. It is said in Canada that the art, as we call it, of minority parliaments is engineering defeat on the most favorable of terms. And we've seen that to a large extent, right? If you can get defeated on a motion of non-confidence, or indeed after T at 24 Sussex, then that's a win for the Prime Minister because he or she starts on the lead foot. But more importantly, or perhaps more interestingly, it also keeps parties in, in, in what a colleague called hostile campaign mode. We stop being conciliatory. We stop trying to make Parliament work. Rather, we focus on leadership and framing the debate so we can control it, right? Just like we would see in an election campaign. Part and parcel of this, and part of the reason that we can see it, is because it's enabled by the public subsidies of Parliament, or, or, or public subsidies of parties, rather. In the Canadian context, until very recently, where it's being phased out, for every vote that a party got, you got $1.75 per vote, uh, amortized for uh, inflation, for the four years that you were uh, in opposition. So if you got a million votes, you'd get 1.75 times a million times four years, and that provides a powerful war chest for parties to play with in the interim election period. What this does, however, and particularly when you have a public subsidy, is this limits the need for party members and activists, right? You can sideline party members, you can sideline party activists because you don't need them for fundraising. The Conservative Party figured out early on in this public subsidy debate that if they can get close to their party members and party activists and raise money, which they were very good at, and we'll come to that again in a minute, then they will be way ahead of the opposition and in a position to cripple the opposition when they introduce the, the reduction of subsidies during the parliamentary crisis, or indeed when they actually succeed in phasing out the, the, the public subsidy when they come to power in 2011. The other bit about the permanent campaign is that it distracts from the House business, right? So you can just sort of govern like you have a majority because you can focus the debate somewhere else, right? And for a prime minister who is in a weak position, that is a useful tactic to use. Now, I think one of the lessons that Canadians learned from Australians is the importance of marginal seats. For the Conservative Party, there was limited room for growth. They were very strong in the West, and we saw that on all three of those maps, that the West was a deep, dark blue. They were weak in the East and sort of marginal in the cities. But on that very first map, if you can remember way back to 2004, Ontario, the big middle bit, was a deep, dark red, and that's where the Liberal Party base really was, right? It was, they claimed they were a national party, and they certainly got national votes, but what really happened was they won 103 out of 103 seats in Ontario. That's a good shot in the arm for a 155-seat majority. 
The Conservative Party is weak, but there's room for growth outside basically Toronto, right? So the 905, the suburbans, all the rest of the cities, and we see this by the time we get to 2008, that they actually make up real ground in suburban Ontario. The Liberal Party, also known as the Natural Governing Party, we see a declining support base. They were never very strong in the, in the West after sort of the Trudeau era. They were strong in cities and they were declining in the East. This is compounded across four elections where the entire support base falls apart. The Liberals are now the third party behind the Conservative Party of Canada, the government, and the New Democratic Party who had never come close to opposition status in the past. But let's look about this a little bit closer. This is party vote since 2004. You'll see the, the Bloc Québécois, which is the separatist party here on the left. Their vote share is declining sort of uh, uh, slightly. This is a bit misleading because the Bloc only runs candidates in Quebec. So they're a national party, so it's amortized across, but it's, it's misleading slightly. You see the Conservative Party, they, gr they certainly grow uh, their, their party vote. Uh, the Green Party grows slightly. The Liberal Party declines slightly. So the combination of the slight decline in the Bloc and the the, the bigger decline in the Liberals, plus the Liberals bleed off votes to the left, results in the, the new uh, um, election dynamic that we've seen. But keep this in mind when we look at the federal seats won since 2004, right? Slight decline in the block, and the block falls off in 2011. Increase remarkably uh, from, for, the, for the Conservative Party with only a small increase in vote share. Precipitous decline by the Liberal Party, with only a small decline in, in vote share, and the NDP. If I put up the majority government from 2011 to the 2000 election, you would see the Liberal Party basically fall off the map, the NDP skyrocket, and the bloc basically disappears, and the Greens would have one. So if we put those two things together, I think it becomes even more stark. Small increases in, in vote share, 8% by uh, the Conservative Party, and over four years, and eventually, over time, you end up with 44 extra seats with an 8% vote share increase, which is, which is stark. The Liberal Party is the flip side of that, of course, and th their vote share declined by a, a slightly larger margin, 10.5%, in part because of the NDP bleeding off support to the left, but their vote share fell 38 seats. So, I mean, it's, it's stark when you put it in those terms, very small uh, increases in vote share because you focus on marginal seats, results in remarkable uh, seat uh, uh, projections. Finally, I think the lesson we have to learn is beware the floor crosser. And there are two examples I want to give. And this is really interesting in the Australian context because in a minority parliament situation, particularly in a minority parliament as close as Australia is, you have to offer incentives for someone to join your team or at least support your team. In 2004, Belinda Stronach crossed the floor from the Conservative Party to join the Liberal Cabinet. She was the first runner-up behind Stephen Harper for the leadership of the new Conservative Party. And the only reason it is suggested that she crossed the floor, even if that was probably closer to her ideological home, was that she was promised the Human Resources Development uh, Portfolio, which was huge, something $2.4 billion annual budget or something, just extraordinary. More interesting for me, because I'm a political scientist, was the David Emerson floor crossing. David Emerson was hand-selected by Prime Minister Paul Martin in the, in the 2004 election in, the, in Vancouver because he needed a strong business person to run for his cabinet. Gets elected to cabinet as a liberal in 2004. They go back to the election. He runs in Vancouver Kingsway again as a liberal in 2006. Never sits as a liberal, crosses the floor, joins the Conservative Party and becomes Foreign Affairs Minister in the, uh, the new Conservative Cabinet. To which his response was, I ran for Parliament to be a Cabinet Minister. I thought at the time the Liberals had the best chance of allowing me to do so. I was wrong. Now the Conservative Party has the best chance for me to do so. So beware the floor crosser because there is a certain amount of self-interest in all of this. So the big finale, what's so bad about minority parliament? And after almost 40 minutes, I think the answer is nothing. Minority parliament is simply a different way of, uh, di simply a different managing mechanism. It's difficult for Australians and Canadians and indeed uh, the Brits 
to understand because it happens so rarely. But really sort of managing competing interests and trying to find winning coalitions is how parliamentary government works in basically the rest of the world. The one sort of negative that I can find about minority parliaments is the short-term focus that all of the parties certainly have, including the government. The focus in the Australian sense is not two to three years or four to five years in the Canadian parliament, but really two to three months and uh, perhaps more cynically, two to three weeks or two to three days, right? What's the next poll tell us? Again, that's not necessarily negative and I don't want to attach a normative response to it, but it is a different way of managing a uh, parliamentary system. Really, I think Australians and Canadians uh, should look to uh, comparative examples, and uh, we're sitting in one now. There's a history of cooperation in chambers lacking majority party. The Australian Senate provides a great example of how to work that coalition to make sure things are successful. And dare I say, the Australian states also provide a very useful uh, examination. Thank you. both ends just there, and we'd be happy to take questions. Thanks, Dr. Banfield. Um, you presented, a, I suppose, a theme of the last 10 years, the rise of conservatives, the decline of liberals. Um, has this phenomenon been reflected in the elections for the provincial assemblies? No, it, it, uh, it, it warms my heart to no end to know that federalism actually works. When the Liberal Party is in charge, conservative parties dominate uh, provincial legislatures. With the conservative party coming to power, liberal parties have begun to dominate uh, provincial legislatures. Proof that not only federalism works, and there's a checkoff between central and state, or central and provincial, but also that you know Canadians, I, I think, and again, I'm speaking on behalf of all Canadians, uh, are smart enough to go, mm, maybe we don't want everybody in charge. And we saw a similar phenomenon uh, during the Howard reign when liberal or state labor parties came to power. I was intrigued by the, uh, Mr. Memerson, I think it was, that crossed the floor to become the cabinet minister. What was the public reaction to that? Was there, a, I mean, as parliamentary um, interested people, we, we naturally have a particular reaction to that, but what was the general public's reaction? Uh, if I recall, the, the, the general public reaction was uh, moral outrage, whether that was genuine or faux, I'm not entirely sure. And it lasted for a couple of weeks until we sent Mr. Emerson overseas and he was out of sight and out of mind. Um, so I, I think parliamentary watchers and, and political scientists like me paid much more attention to uh, the Emerson floor cross than, than the average Canadian. Uh, I, was, I was very interested to hear your remarks about the role played by the Speaker, uh, especially during that uh, decade of the, of after 2000. Could you describe uh, his background and uh, uh, any other interesting facet of uh, his uh, character and behaviour? That's slightly loaded, isn't it? Um, Peter Milliken uh, was a Liberal Party member for Kingston and the Islands. Uh, Kingston is a small city. He is a long-term party member. I believe his father was MP for Kingston and the Islands as well. And he is the only person that I have ever read about, heard about, or met that grew up dreaming and wanting to be the speaker. He, w he is the most well-versed individual on parliamentary practice uh, that I have certainly come across. He is, he lived, breathed, and sort of embodied the role of the speakers down to the house in the Gatineau Hills, and he actually lived in the little apartment given to the speaker at, the, at Parliament. Um, on parliamentary tradition and parliamentary uh, procedure, he was spot on, it's sort of an, an encyclopedic memory. It was, it was remarkable. In the house, um, and, and this is clearly my view, not anyone else's view. Uh, he left a little bit to be desired in terms of speaker. He let 
the rabble get a little too loud for my liking. And occasionally, I would have just liked him to go, shoo. But he never did that. So if I have one complaint about Peter Milliken, it's his, it was his laid back nature. That was, how was he able to secure speakership across both governments? Uh, the Liberal government was really easy. He was, you know, the, he was one of the few that actually ran for it. For a conservative government, it's pure strategy. Take him out of the voting benches and put him in. Plus, you need a, a steadying hand, right? I mean, it, as we saw, he played a very important role across all three of the minority parliaments, and it's nice to have a steady hand on the t tiller, but the, d don't downplay the, uh, the strategy move to take him off the crossbench. You talked a bit about um, it being important to set clear and manageable targets so you can then go ahead and, and as a government, uh, achieve. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how you actually go about setting that agenda and setting those targets in the context of a minority government where, you know, it might be having to deal with a lot of different agendas. Um, I, I think it's really important to have a clear set of policy goals right off the hop and whether those policy goals appear in or, or from the policy conference or from the election platform, it doesn't really matter, but they have to be written down somewhere so you can fall behind them as a shield. I think the other part is when, and, and this is part of the management, sort of different managing mechanism, is that you have to be a little bit flexible on, on, on what your goals are, right? So if your goal is, if your goal is X and your opponent's goal is B, then maybe the least defensive position is Q, and you can bring in one of the minor parties. So there has to be some flexibility built into it, but you need to speak with uh, sort of one voice saying, okay, this is what we want to do. We might not be able to do it this parliament, but if we can get halfway there, then we're, then, then we're more than halfway home the next, when we get to be uh, in charge. I think that's uh, the advice I have. I noticed that uh, on your screen that it's not compulsory voting over there. We do have it in Australia. Can you indicate the change in party support in Canada with a change in the number of people or the percentage of people who cast a vote? No, I think it's the short answer. Um, when voter turnout federally was 75 or 80 percent, the Liberal Party won. When voter turnout was 60 percent, the Liberal Party still won. I suspect if voter turnout turns down to 50 percent, the Liberal Party will win again. Uh, I think it's tenuous to draw a, a, a bright white line between voter turnout and, and party change. Um, there's some interesting work being done uh, at my alma mater at the University of Calgary that says even non-voters, and it turns out non-voters are also non-survey filler-outers. Uh, non-voters are sort of genuinely happy, at least in the Alberta context, with the governing party, and voting turnout in Alberta is appalling, somewhere around 50 percent. Um, but the, the governing party is closest to the median voter on all issues except government intervention, I think. So maybe it's, I, I don't have a good answer, is the short answer. Of my not of uh, minority government uh, between um, comparing Australia and Canada. Would you like to comment on the role of the upper house um, in both countries? Sure. Uh, the, the upper house here actually plays a role as opposed to the upper house back home. Uh, they're elected, they have democratic legitimacy here, and they provide a very good uh, checking component. The upper house back home, much to my chagrin, is the last bastion of appointed party hacks. Uh, very rarely, uh, even when uh, Stephen Harper came to power in 2006, faced with a liberal dominated upper house, things might have got slowed down a little bit, but certainly nothing was ever knocked back to them. So the, the Senate actually plays a role in managing minority parliament here, whereas back home is just the, the rubber stamp. We've seen uh, at the last federal election that the Conservative Party have been able to win a majority, but without Quebec seats. Do you think that we entered a new era in Canadian politics, so you can be able to win a majority government without any province seat? Maybe. Um, 
which is probably not the answer that you wanted to hear. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, there could have been one election is an anomaly, two elections are a trend, three is proven fact. Um, so I'm going to fall behind my sword of, or, or my shield of, we need more research and talk to me in 2020. The, I think the real answer is perhaps, uh, particularly with the left splitting the vote between the Liberals and the NDP, uh, and with an increased power base movement towards the West, uh, there's something like 35 additional seats being added in as a result of the next census, and none of them for the first time will be in Quebec. Uh, very few will be in Ontario. All kinds will go to Alberta and BC. So the, 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 the real answer may be maybe, but I, uh, there, there will never be a day where you can form legitimate government um, with, without Quebec involved. At least one or two members, at least. Any further questions? gentleman on the left and then the gentleman on, on my right. One of the um, features of independent government here, uh, of minority government here, has been the role of independents who, because the government has needed their support to form government, have been able to exercise significant influence on policies in which they had particular interests. From your presentation, I gather that there haven't been independence in the Canadian Parliament. Can you comment on what difference that makes and why there haven't been independence in the Canadian Parliament? Uh, the 2004 election, there were three independents, uh, two former Conservatives and a former Liberal, all of which were booted out of caucus and had to sit as independents. Uh, and they played a, a invaluable role in securing the budget for the, for the Martin government. I think part of the answer for the lack of independence uh, in Canadian parliaments is the control of the party leader. And party, uh, people vote by party label, right? So it's, look, I'm a liberal, my grandfather was a liberal, his grandfather's grandfather was a liberal, I'm gonna vote liberal. I sort of know this guy, but he's not gonna do anything for me. You have more power to your local MP inside a party than outside a party, so I think that's certainly part of the story. Um, I, I don't have more of an explanation than that, but I think that's a, a good chunk of the explanation. <clears throat> with, the in, with the change in the numbers across the country from east to west, is there a fixed number of par parliamentarians so that those, is there an increase in the numbers in the west, is there a decrease in the east? No. Um, the, the, there's seat distribution just based on the census. So um, there's a constitutional reason and then there's, um, particularly in Quebec, you can't fall below a certain number because of the founding fathers. Uh, so there's just increased addition to seats as opposed to subtraction of seats. What will the number be at the next election? Uh, 338 and 308, 40, 38, 146, 156, something like that. Big population growth. We have time for one last question, if anybody would like to ask. Uh, yes, up the back there. You might need to come to a microphone, I suspect. I don't know. Um, which is probably a remarkably unsatisfying answer. Um, it will depend on any number of things, not least of which who the NDP select as their new leader. Uh, and the real question that I think the NDP has to face going forward was the surge in party support, a vote for Jack Layton, or was it a vote for the New Democratic Party? Uh, because of the surge in Quebec and the progressive left that dominates Quebec, I think you can make an argument that it was a vote for probably both, but you know, at least it's a plausible argument to be made that it was a vote for uh, the New Democratic Party. You cannot downplay the importance of Jack Layton in Quebec, and I don't know, and I'll tell you better after uh, 2014, whether or not you can catch lightning in a bottle twice. Uh, Liberal Party are still in disarray. They still can't raise money. 
the NDP is much better at raising money than, uh, uh, than the Liberals at the time. Uh, they don't have a particularly effective leader either. I mean, they have an effective interim leader, but they don't have a permanent leader. Uh, so maybe is the, the long, short answer to your question. Well, thank you all very much for coming to today's lecture. Please join me in thanking Dr. Banfield. Mm -hmm.